will stream in, but um, I'm just gonna, because a lot of people just got in here. Um, we'd love it if you just introduce yourself in the comments. Um, any other information you wanna throw on there, if you're, you know, where you're from, maybe organizations or Twitter handle or pronouns, whatever you think is important. Um, go ahead and give yourself an intro. Um, and uh, we'd love to, you know, have this as an opportunity for everyone to build connection, you know, because um, this isn't just about watching a movie. We got some work that we got to do. So, um, so those connections are very important. And uh, well said, Andre, and make sure when you guys are commenting or commenting panelists and attendees, because if you just comment to us panelists, no one else is going to like see what, what you said. So uh, make sure you're doing that. And uh, this is a webinar, so you won't be, unless we like click on you, you won't be unmuted. Let's see here. Do we, oh yeah. And then the other thing I'll add is that we have, um, we have Q and A open. We'll be doing the panel after the film. Um, so feel free to just throw out the event as you have questions, use the Q and A feature. Um, and, uh, we'll try to do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Um, we might have some people working them in the chat or, you know, answering via text, but then we'll also try to get our panelists to talk about it too. So, um, you know, we're really trying to, um, help everyone really feel like they understand understand the campaign, understand the fight, because um, that's how we're going to win. And hey, 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 we got Justin Jackson there here. Hey. Oh, about, hello. Uh, having problems getting on, but we're good. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So we're just letting people roll in right now, Justin. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we'll probably uh, get started in just a minute or two. Okay. Um, but we got a full panel now. Uh, Georgia wants to be made host. I will do that. I assume that makes me not host anymore. Just give it back to me when you're uh, when you're finished, Georgia, because I'm probably gonna need it. Yeah, um, so I'm just going live on Facebook. It'll take a few minutes and then um, I will see if uh, I can make you host without disrupting that live feed. <laughs> um, sure. but, but if not, uh, we'll just go go off of live. So, you know, I mean, if you want to just work the work, the hosting part, um, okay. that might work fine as well. I don't need to do it. It might be easier for me, actually. <laughs> OK, sounds good. Got Cindy Jacobs, one of our legal and legislative experts in the chat. So good to know we've Super. got a phone a friend in case there's any really hard questions. All right. Hey, look at that. We got like 98 people streaming in. Yep, and I, what do you say? Let's, should we kick this thing Go off? For it, man. Kick All right, it off. cool. Well, thank you everyone uh, for being here today, sharing one of the last days of Black History Month with whole Washington. Um, we're super excited to show you Power to Heal. We're gonna learn together, we're gonna learn about the passage of Medicaid and the role that it played in ending the injustice of segregation in our hospital system. And uh, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Andre Stackhouse, and I'm an organizer with Whole Washington, along with uh, my colleagues, Sean Cavanaugh, Laura Fielding. Um, and uh, we 
um, are so lucky to have some amazing, uh, amazing guests. We've got Justin Jackson running back for the LA Chargers. And uh, I have to say someone who is quickly becoming just as well known for his political voice and his advocacy. So uh, thank you so much. And we also have Dr. Victoria Dooley, a physician, a uh, family medicine practitioner, um, a Bernie Sanders surrogate and a nationally prominent healthcare advocate. So I'm really excited to hear, um, hear what she has to say today. Um, and uh, I am wearing this red beret in solidarity with um, healthcare activists all over the country, people who are trying to pass it at home, people who are trying to pass it um, nationally. And uh, so I'm gonna start by throwing this to Laura who can tell you a little bit more about that. You know, I'm not seeing Laura on the yeah. call. Yeah. <laughs> I think maybe her internet went out. I'm gonna call her right now, but let's let's stick with you for right now, Andre. Okay, Laura might have dropped, um, but she'll be back, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, uh, so um, we can go ahead and uh, Justin, did you want to introduce yourself a little bit more? Um, you know, take a couple minutes. Floor is yours. Okay. Wow. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you having me on. My name is Justin Jackson. Um, like Andre said, play for the LA Chargers. Uh, I guess that's kind of like my day job. <laughs> um, but mostly I'm pretty active politically. Um, and yeah, so I've been kind of on this front for the past year now. So obviously a lot of y'all have been fighting a lot longer than I have, but I'm I'm happy to be part of it now. And I'm very happy to amplify this message. Um, it's something that obviously is much, much needed in the country. I don't think anyone on this call needs to hear why. I think we all know, um, but it's vitally important right now, the way I see it, um, you know, with this democratic, fully democratic government, I mean, now's the time. Now's the time to be pushing this nationally. And if we can push it on a state to state level, whether that's here in Washington, in New York, or, you know, like my friend Al Chikora has has put up in California as well. Um, and that and that can really be a catalyst for maybe getting it more nationally or or just working it through state by state. So I'm really happy to, like I said, amplify this message. I'm happy to be in this fight. It is vitally important. I've personally been affected. You know, I have my own healthcare stories. And I'll just tell it quick. My mom, when I was younger, when I was three or four years old, my mom passed away from breast cancer. Um, I, and obviously, the emotional toll that has on a family, that's easy to see. You know, a lot of people have dealt with that in their own personal families. But once I got older, I started asking some of my family members about, like, how was it financially for us going through that situation? Um Obviously, my mom had to get a lot of treatment, cancer treatment, chemo, all, all that stuff, um, and eventually hospice care as well. So obviously, that cost too. Um, and I was, I learned that you know my mom was worried about continuing to get treatment for a long period of time because of what it was, the financial strain it was putting on our family, and just thinking of that, just in a, in a hum, hum, humanity terms, it's just it's unbelievable. It's it's very inhumane. It's a completely irrational and broken healthcare system and something that doesn't make me unique or my family unique. It makes us just one of the many people that have to go through situations very similar to this. And then now we have a healthcare pandemic that's obviously exacerbated multitudes, multitudes exponentially. So this is really a, a good time, I believe, for us to be, you know, putting forth something like this into the national spotlight. In this time of crisis, I think this is a very important time to be pushing this. So like I said in the beginning, I'm very happy to be a part of this. Thank you so much for having me. And whatever I can do to continue to amplify this message, please let me know. Um, healthcare is one of the main things that I, one of the main issues that, that I, uh, I'm i very passionate about and fight for. So glad to be a part of this with y'all. Glad to, to be on this call. And th thanks again for having me. Thank you so much, Justin. And uh, I'm really, um, I mean, your story is so real for so many people. That's the thing about healthcare is it's something that comes to all of us. Um, you know, it's it's something that we all have to face at some point in our life. And uh, I'm really glad you brought up the democratic control of the government because that parallels our fight here in Washington where we gave the Democratic Party 
uh, trifecta on our government in 2018, and we've held it okay. for them. Um, okay. So uh, we're in a similar position there. Um, but I'd like to I'd like to hand the floor now to Dr. Dooley, um, and uh, I know that she'll have some really uh, really really um, uh, helpful and insightful wisdom to share with us. And uh, I just realized now though, Georgia, um, can you just, I'm not host anymore. Can you just make sure that this is recording? <laughs> um, Cause I can't do it anymore. So um, anyway, uh, with no further ado, uh, Dr. Dooley. Uh, can, can you hear me? You sound great. Okay. I'm Dr. Victoria Dooley. I'm a fa practicing family medicine physician. I'm a mother. I was a Bernie 2020 surrogate and I'm very passionate about um, Medicare for all. And so when I talk about Medicare for all, specifically to people of color, right? Because this is Black History Month, I get a lot of, well, you know, Medicare for all isn't going to cure racism. And I get it, it's not. Um, but I've been there as a physician, um, as a patient, my pain has been ignored. Black females' pain is not as uh, believed as, as white people when they go in the hospital. Uh, we don't get pain meds because they believe our skin is thicker and tougher we, and we, we can tolerate more pain. So I've been part of the racist, uh, systemic and institutional racism in medicine as um, a Black female training to be a doctor and as a Black patient. And so no, just giving everybody health insurance is not going to magically make that go away. But what I think is not talked about enough is what more a Medicare for all bill can actually do, right? It can do so much more than just provide health care for, pe for people. We, activists like us, we can walk and chew gum, right? And if you look at what Medicare did, Medicare, the existing Medicare that we have, it desegregated hospitals because when we were freed slaves, there were there was disparities like there are today, but worse, there were black hospitals where they didn't have the funds that they needed to take care of uh, us. And so in order to get these hospitals and systems somewhat desegregated, Medicare came along and said, hey, if you want to get these federal dollars, you have to desegregate your hospitals. So Medicare for all can do so much more for people of color. Um, as part of the Medicare for all bill, we can make it mandatory that physicians, nurses, all healthcare providers have implicit bias training. And an implicit bias is an unconscious bias, right? Some of the beliefs that are taught and some of the beliefs that are subconscious about people of different colors and different race that leads to disparities within healthcare systems. We can make mandatory implicit bias training part of the bill. We can make it mandatory that the Medicare for all not only cover dental, vision, mental health, right? But we can also make it as part of the bill that it covered transportation so that people who are overworked and underpaid and don't have don't live in cities where there's good public transportation live in rural areas or don't have reliable transportation because we don't have a livable wage in this country can have transportation vouchers so that they can get to their um, medical appointments we can demand that medicare for all cover telemedicine something that i'm excited that's being covered now during the pandemic but this will be covered forever because too often we have people who are working and they don't have the time to get to the doctor and park and wait, but they do have maybe a 15 or 20 minute break that they can clock out and talk to their doctor on phone. And when you talk about rural people, a lot of the times they are an hour away from the major health systems because the major big conglomerate hospitals are buying up their, their small rural health systems and closing them down. So then if you're pregnant, you have to have a baby, the nearest hospital is an hour away. So I just want people to remember that Medicare for all, yes, it is healthcare for all. It is saying that you have the right to not die from illnesses that are too expensive for you to treat simply because you are a human being. But not only that, as part of the bill, we can make it address racism in medicine. And Medicare for now, Medicare that we have now, it makes hospitals be held accountable to certain measures and, and patient surveys. We need to let hospitals know if you don't, to be aware of these implicit biases and treat their patients more equitably, you're going to have some consequences, whether those be financial consequences or patients are able to sue the doctors, we need to put them on alert. Not only are you giving health care to everyone, but you are going to make sure that the people who work in your hospitals and health systems are treating all people 
justly and fairly and not making biases on the color based on the color of their skin. So um, I want to thank Laura. I want to thank Georgia. I want to thank Cole Washington just for making me part of this family. Uh, we met in Twitter. I meet some of the best people on Twitter and they keep me, they keep my head styling and profiling. So I just want to say that I really uh, appreciate you include me as part of your family. Thank you so much, Dr. Dooley. And uh, just uh, shouting it out there, I'm Captain Stack, would love a follow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm going to go ahead and try to, uh, and by the way, I want to thank you so much for bringing, um, you know, the conversation to health justice. We're not just talking about health care. Um, and so I think that's what's really um, such a great opportunity with this event is we'll be able to have a conversation about health justice. Um, so uh, we're going to get into that with the movie and with the panel, but I'm just going to set a little bit more context before we go. Laura can get on um, as well. But um, I just want to set some context for all the folks out there who maybe aren't as familiar with whole Washington or maybe not even as familiar with the, the fight for Medicare for all, which is all across the country. It's a decades long fight. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to help everyone understand where we are today. And so, you know, whole Washington is a group of volunteer activists who want to pass Medicare for all statewide in Washington. And uh, it sounds simple, but a lot of people don't quite understand what that means. So I'm going to break it down. The first thing that it means is universal. That's for everybody. So we're going to create a health insurance plan that covers everyone in Washington state. The second thing that it means is that it's comprehensive. Medical, dental, vision, mental health, reproductive care, if you need it, it's covered. Um, the third thing that it means is it's public and it's nonprofit. Um, that's very important because we're not gonna be making money off of this. We're not skimming some profit off the top. Um, we're not paying bonuses to CEOs and shareholders. We want healthcare to cost what it costs and no more. So that's why it's public and nonprofit. And the last thing that, it means that it's free at the point of service. You go in, you get care, you go home. Nobody hands you a bill. You don't have to double check your deductible. You don't have to wait on hold with your insurance company. You get the care that you need because you need it. So, a lot of people also want to know, how do we pay for it? And the answer is actually really simple. We're going to hold a giant GoFundMe, and we're just going to crowdsource it. So that's actually a joke. And uh, if it's not funny, I would just like to remind everyone that there are 250,000 real campaigns on GoFundMe right now where people are trying to uh, raise the money that they need in order to get the medical care that they need. So it's not so funny to them either. So the serious answer is that we're gonna pay for this progressive taxation and that's all there is to it. Um, and uh, we're so fortunate to have had our bill analyzed by uh, Dr. Gerald Friedman, professor of economics at University of Massachusetts Amherst, who found that our bill costs 9 billion less than our current healthcare system. So. We're gonna cover everybody and we're gonna pay for it by paying less than what we pay right now. So people also wanna know how we're gonna pass it. And whole Washington has two answers to that. We've got a legislative strategy and we have a ballot initiative strategy. Um, so just briefly touching on the legislative strategy, I've already mentioned that we delivered a trifecta to the Democratic party. Um, delegates like myself and Jason Call worked on the party platform made sure that Medicare for all is in the state party platform. So this should be a no brainer. Allegedly our government completely supports what we're doing. And yet the legislative path has killed two of our bills in committee. Um, and the only reason they've ever given for why they can't co-sponsor our bill is because it doesn't have enough co-sponsors. Um, so that's not a good enough answer for me. And that's why we're really fortunate to have the ballot initiative here in Washington state. We don't need to ask permission. We don't need to wait. We can put this on the ballot 
and we can pass this using uh, the people can pass this themselves. Um, and so then that brings me to uh, the idea of passing this through the state. Um, we think that this is a fight that's not over until everyone in our country has comprehensive healthcare coverage. And we believe that the fastest path to that is through the state. And we don't just believe that because that's how it happened with gay marriage and that's how it happened with cannabis, but that's also how it happened with healthcare in a country called Canada and in a small province called Saskatchewan. They passed Medicare for all for themselves first and Canada came next. Um, so this is a, uh, this is a tested strategy. And so um, again, that's why I'm wearing this red beret to show some national solidarity. And I wanna shout out, we got campaigns in New York, California, Maine, Maryland, a ton more. I know some of them are in the, uh, they're with us today. So I'm really, really glad that you're here because this is national movement. We're only passing this if we do it all together. Um, and so uh, if you're out there, um, wholewashington.org is how you can support our campaign, but you can go to onepayerstates.org and uh, find out what's going on in your state or make something uh, start going on in your state. Because again, this is, a, this is an all hands on deck situation. Um, so uh, I'm now going to share my screen very briefly. Um, and I want you to spend a minute looking at these numbers here and uh, take a moment to let them sink in and try to think what might these numbers represent. So this first one, 31 million with an M, that's the number of people without health insurance in this country. 530,000, that's the number of medical bankruptcies annually in this country. 45,000, that's the number of preventable deaths due to uninsurance annually. Now I want you to take a moment to, now that you know what these numbers represent as a statistic, think about who these people are. What do they like? What are their lives like? Where do they come from? Because with statistics like these, the answer to that question invariably that they are the most marginalized people in our society, the most vulnerable, the most neglected. Um, and so I wanna bring that back around to the concept of health justice. Um, and so, uh, you know, in order to tie that in and, uh, you know, use Black History Month as an opportunity to reflect on that. I've uh, found this quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We are concerned about the constant use of federal funds to support this most notorious expression of segregation of all the forms of inequality. Injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman because it often results in physical death. Um, so I hope that uh, you'll carry the concept of healthcare justice and um, you'll carry this quote into the film and uh, allow it to drive your reflection during the movie um, so that we can have a really great conversation about it in our panel afterwards. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now, um, but again, I am just so happy to have this panel and to have everyone here today. Um, I unfortunately do not see Laura yet. So I think we're probably gonna move into, um, into the film now, um, but uh, hopefully she'll be able to join us for the panel. So. Um, I'm so excited to share this with you. It's such an awesome documentary um, and we have so much to learn for it. It's history, but it's deeply relevant to, um, to the campaigns that we're running today uh, because there are a lot of injustices still in our system and um, we're, uh, we're not just trying to make healthcare deeper. We're trying to actually create a more just healthcare system. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop talking and get the movie going.
Okay, we back. We are back. Hey everybody, I hope oh you enjoyed goodness. the movie. It's always very powerful to watch. Um, yeah, Andre, take it away. Yeah, well, um, uh, you know, I uh, haven't actually seen the whole movie before. I was a little late to the last screening. So this was um, really incredible for me to, to finally see the whole thing. Um, and uh, man, so powerful. Um, really excited to talk about it with our panel. But we also have Laura Fielding back. Um, so before we go into our panel, uh, Laura, I'd love if you would um, like to give the statement that you had planned for the, for the kickoff. Um, I think it's still just as relevant right now. Oh no. Let me it's just say muted, that Laura. as many, oh, there you are. as many, uh, can you hear me? Oh. Yep. Okay. Uh, I cursed a lot and cried a little. And then I realized as I settled into the film, once I brought my computer to work, uh, that it's nothing. <laughs> Internet trouble is. So I'm Laura Field. I'm honored to be joining going to watch the power to heal with all of you. I'm the executive director of Red Berets Medicare for All and board member of Whole Washington. The seeds of my healthcare justice acted while living and studying in the UK for seven and a half years, where, where healthcare is guaranteed through the NHS. It was established more than 70 years served in the United States Air Force one year in South Korea. Speaking as an Air Force veteran is a jobs pr program or as a means of guaranteeing health care for oneself. Family. Yet this is precisely people enlist. I found my calling as a holistic health care practitioner. I treat people with many different conditions at Mar Marconi Chiropractic and Wellness, where I offer cranial sacral therapy, therapeutic, and bio massage. How can working people who can't afford their premiums, co-pays, deductibles, and outrageous cost of prescriptions come to see me? Doesn't everyone des deserve to seek holistic treatment? The whole Washington Health Trust, SB 5204, would cover these therapists. Which brings me to one thing I'd love to, one more thing I'd love to share about myself and some crafters who have joined me in a true labor of love. We began knitting and crocheting red berets for Medicare for All and National Nurses United Red in the fall of 2017. We chose berets because in the wealthiest nation on earth, we need to stop allowing our politicians to fund endless wars while they deny the American people what every developed nation on earth has including Canada. They passed their Medicare system years ago because Saskatchewan province fought like hell against a lot of moneyed interests and opposition. They prevailed and so will we. To my fellow creative artists, you know who you are. Thank you for the hours you give as you love each stitch with intention for healthcare justice. All of us together. There's a place for every talent and skill in this movement. Sharing the power to heal is perhaps one of the most potent calls to action we can do. When they say we can't do this, just remember it's been done by our neighbors to the north in Canada. Amazing people like my sister who lives there with her family and loves her health care. In st standing in solidarity with hope help us open the floodgate. Finally, here's a shout out to our revolution, Washington Bernie Crack our amazing event co-sponsors. Power to Heal is part of an annual weekend of organizing they put on. And this, my friends, is why organizations like Whole Wash vital to the national movement. The ballot initiative process brought us to get relationship direct democracy can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, and uh, if anyone out there wants to... Did you hear part of what I said? <laughs> <laughs> a little jittery, um, but I think, uh, I think it all came through clearly in the end. Um, 
and uh, all of you uh, are welcome to purchase your own Red Beret to join us in solidarity in this nationwide um, fight. And uh, if you'd like to get more involved, I'm sure Laura can, um, can hook you up. Uh, I'm sure that we need as many people as who want to um, knitting these berets. It helps raise funds. It helps pay for uh, petitions, which we will need to be collecting um, a lot of signatures uh, if we go this ballot initiative path. And they're not cheap. Um, so in a very real way, you really can help um, help create and sustain this movement. Um, so thank you so much, Laura. Okay, so um, with that, I'd like us to move into our panel. You've met our panelists already. Um, so I think the best way to kick this off is I would like to um, ask Justin a question. Um, and that is, uh, you know, um, I want to ask you about what it's like being um, an activist, a uh, person of color in activism. Um, when I think of, of Black athletes who become political figures, I think of people like Muhammad Ali, people like Colin Kaepernick um, taking a knee. And I noticed something about this, which is that they're often associated with causes that are highly linked to Black identity or thought of as Black issues. And um, even though we just watched this documentary and saw how in, in very real ways, healthcare is, um, is a Black issue and is an issue for people of color. Um, I, it's not as traditionally associated um, it's not thought of that way as much. So I'm just wondering how that's affected um, affected your experience in activism. Um, and uh, you know, you were very humble about about being new to it, and you know, not having done it for uh, for very long. But um, but I'm sure you have a lot of really valuable experiences already. So I want to hear more about them. Hmm, am I having internet issues or is everyone else having internet issues? It says Laura's network bandwidth is low. Maybe you no, can cut think, your video. I think Justin stepped out for a minute. So if you could message him and ask him to come back on. We can, you can re-ask that question. Okay, I didn't realize he had stepped away. Um, no worries, but I think we could um, answer a few questions while he oh there he is oh i'm sorry yeah i'm back sorry no worries. Real no. Quick. No what was worries. the question i missed it well i wanted to ask you about um your experience as a as a black athlete in activism and uh you know i had the observation thinking about you know what i wanted to ask you um that you know athletes like muhammad ali and colin kaepernick we're highly associated with issues that are traditionally thought of as black issues like police yeah. violence um, and healthcare, even though we just watched a movie that showed um, how in very real ways uh, does um, disproportionately affect the black community. Um, it's not traditionally thought of as much as a black issue. And so I'm just kind of curious to hear about your experience and activism so far, how that's affected um, how, you know, people have received your activism um, and, you know, you were very humble about how, how long you've been doing it. Um, but I'm, I'm really curious about your experience so far. So, yeah, I mean, you're hundred percent right. I think it is actually funny during the 2020 primary, um, when things like Medicare for all came up, you know, people would be like, well, you know, what's Bernie's black agenda, right? Well, what do you mean? Like Medicare for all is part of the black agenda, right? You're actually, if you look at the numbers disproportionately, black people are the most likely to not have healthcare or to be underinsured, right? So I think more people are starting to wake up to the fact that, especially black folks, when you actually talk to them, that these are issues, big issues within the black community. And if you, it's more of a messaging thing where you, you need to cater that message like this universal program 
will actually not only disproportionately help the black community, it's also harder for that program to be attacked if it's not just, oh, this is just for the black community or this is just for the Hispanic community or et cetera, et cetera, Native American community, whatever. If it's actually a universal program, it's it'll lift all of us up, but it's actually gonna lift up black people disproportionately because we are disproportionately affected by that. And so I believe it's a messaging issue. And that's something that I try and take into, you know, whatever conversations I'm having, whether it's with someone who's you know, a person of color, white person, whatever. Um, you know, this is how this program or this is how this fight, this is how it'll affect your life personally, materially, tangibly. And in that sense, I think it's a lot easier to kind of um, root, in, root them into, into the cause and not, you know, not for them to feel like it's kind of a uh, more of a superficial thing they're fighting for. I think that's something that it, it's people are tired of having to vote for someone else, right? Or vote like, yes, I would love to vote for this marginalized community who may be marginally affected by having a Democrat in office, not a Republican. But there are people, you can't always expect people to do that every election cycle, right? So I want to let them know, well, this program, this candidate is actually going to affect your life personally and help improve your life and your situation. Here's why you should support this. So I, I really do think it's a messaging thing. Um, and yeah, and like you said, everyone knows that policing and police brutality and criminal justice reform is a Black issue because we are disproportionately affected by that. It's very clear. It's in your face, right? When it comes to you know, health care and health it's not as in your face, it's not as apparent, but when you break it down to someone um, and you really explain it to them in, in a super easy and digestible way, they can start to see how that is also a Black issue. That's something that also affects Black people disproportionately, and that's something that we should be fighting for on that front, just as hard as criminal justice reform, even though it's not as in your face, you know, it's not as, you know, televised or talked about um, by the media. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I think that making making politics personal is um, is so important. It's it's the only way you can truly mobilize people to um, do the work that's required to get things done. So um, I really appreciate that perspective. Uh, did any of our other panelists um, uh, have any have any thoughts on that? Well, cool. Um, so uh, I, I want to make it clear also that um, I do want these questions to be to the panel. Um, but uh, that first one was was a more personal question. But in general, I want these to be to the panel. Um, but I wanted to now talk a little bit about the idea of building that solidarity across, um, across states and across a national movement. Um, you know, we are organizing out here in Washington and um, we're just getting to the point where we're getting the kind of visibility to sort of be part of, of a national conversation on this. It's, it's, we've been organizing since 2017 and healthcare has been one of the top issues um, for a lot longer than that. Um, and yet it feels like we're only just now being treated as if uh, we have a role to play in that. So I want to ask the panel um, what ideas they have and what learnings they might've taken from the film about how we can break through and um, sort of make the case to the national movement that we have an important role to play and that we need their support and that it's worth, um, it's worth them giving us that support. I think one of the important takeaways from the movie is that the civil rights movement wasn't just about desegregating um, beaches, wasn't, about wasn't only about desegregating lunch counters. Um, it was about all of society and that all these issues surrounding um, civil rights and justice were important. So 
Um, I think a lot of people don't know that the civil rights movement was focused on uh, medicine, on, Medi on Medicare, on uh, just providing people the ability to go see a doctor. And so when we're trying to build our movement, we need to also be trying to make the case and connecting these other issues. So like, for instance, this fight for $15 minimum wage, like Justin Jackson was talking about, um, you know, most people, most uh, minimum wage workers, you know, a majority of them are black. Um, and, you know, just having a living wage allows people to like, think about paying for their medicine, you know, going to $15 isn't, you know, that's the difference between right now making $15,000 a year to $30,000. It's still going to be a struggle, but it's going to be less. And, but maybe some of them are going to be lifted out of poverty and have that ability to like, take that day off to go see the doctor rather than, you know, the decisions are already made that they can't go see one. So lending our voice to movements such as that, climate change will help build this movement and push it forward. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I think there's really something that's it's related to uh, Justin's answer earlier is that this is in general a more hidden issue. Um, I think it's the sort of thing that people often don't think about until it's actually a really serious issue for them. Um, you know, it's it can be um, a little late to become a healthcare activist after um, after you've received the bill. Um, uh, but it's also when it becomes real for a lot of people. And uh, I just wanted to actually take the opportunity to answer um, a question submitted uh, by the audience, which was with 31 million people uninsured. Why aren't 31 million people activists for Medicare for all? So um, I, I want to say a couple things about that. One is um, in, in many of the most seismic um, changes to our society, uh, the number of activists who are able to actually make these changes comes out to less than 1% of the population. Um, so we, we think of something like the civil rights movement as something that engulfed our society, but actually most people experienced it abstractly um, through the media from a distance. Um, it wasn't personal to them. Um, and so 31 million people, um, that's a big number. It's a really big number and it is enough people to make a real difference if they could become activists on it and be, could become truly organized around it. Um, but the other part of that is 31 million people uninsured, uh, those are not necessarily the people who have a lot of um, space in their life for activism and organization. And it's actually one of the reasons healthcare is a really, really important thing for us to organize around because it turns out that people who have their backs up against the wall um, and who feel desperation in their daily lives uh, don't have time to be active citizens and to build the kind of society they want to live in. Um, and so I think that uh, if we believe in democracy, I actually think that we have to also believe that people need to be given enough opportunity to be active participants in democracy. Um, and the fact is, if you're, if you're just trying to be well and alive, um, you don't have the space for it. So I think that that, um, I think that that all ties together um, in really, uh, it, it, they're very overlapping, uh, intersectional, if you will. It's, it's sort of intersectional, um, intersectional issues. Um, so uh, thank you so much for submitting that question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bounce off on that question um, that we do have like those 31 million that aren't uh, that don't have health insurance, I believe that they are organized and they are um, activists in their own way. Just like in this movie, we saw the Black uh, community coming together to um, take care of each other um, in the ways that were passed down from their elders, um, the best way that they knew how. And you can see that today with mutual aid programs. Um, but we see that it's not enough. Um, they do their best um, and they know it's an issue, but it's not enough. Uh, they don't have the resources. And 
for us as a movement, you know, they, these communities already know it's important. We just have to reach out, start talking to them. And, you know, like Andre was saying, you know, they're living paycheck to paycheck. They're just, a lot of them are surviving. And so we have to make room and provide resources for them to come in and add their voices and add their energy, you know, be it, you know, carpooling when we can, providing food, providing daycare, providing resources, you know, maybe they work two, three or two, two or three jobs, you know, providing, you know, some income to let them do some of this organizing and activism work will really help bring in working class and poor people into the movement. So uh, I see another uh, good audience question, um, which is we would like to recruit more influencers like Justin here in North Carolina, any tips for doing that? Um, and so, uh, you know, Justin, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you came to know about Whole Washington. I think you might've touched on it earlier, um, but also uh, I, I don't know if um, you want to take this question as well, Laura, but um, you've done some really great work there as well. So um, so I'd love to hear what our panel has to say about that. I mean, yeah, honestly, I'll defer to Laura because I mean, it's a lot of her work, you know, on, uh, on social media that, that caught my attention. Um, you know, I research this stuff pretty closely and, and just the fact that um, California has our own <clears throat> single payer bill that's now being proposed um, so I was interested to see what other parts of the country had something similar going on. Obviously, saw New York. I know, Andre, you mentioned earlier that there's some um, other coalitions fighting for that in other states as well. So, um, yeah, I guess I would just maybe point to some of the uh, uh, states around uh, North Carolina that have something similar going on. Um, and just kind of be relentless. I know Laura is relentless on social media. And I love it because she's fighting for something that's super important. So um, never be afraid to kind of be relentless in your pursuit of, of gaining more people. Um, you know, I think it's very hard to see someone fighting for the right things relentlessly and, and be upset with them for that. Um, so I, I say, yeah, just be relentless in that pursuit. Um, definitely, you know, social media campaigns. <clears throat> um, I don't know any anything, any type of, I mean, obviously hard during COVID, but, um, you know, during regular times, just events that people can come to. Free food is always a, a you know, easy way to get people to, to stop by and share a message. So you just got to be creative and innovative. Um, just throw everything at the wall, see what sticks, I would say. Um, yeah, and I would just add, like, you don't get what you don't ask for. And I... Um, I have been really uh, taken by how much um, how much goodwill I've received just for asking. Um, events like this are really great because instead of saying, "Hey, uh, you know, well-connected, famous person," um, I have this campaign that I'm working on, and I'd like to ask you to do a bunch of work for it. Um, instead with the, an event like this, you can say, I'm really honored to invite you to uh, share this event with us. And, you know, I'd be doubly honored if you wanted to be a panelist, you know, that's been uh, a really good strategy to say, um, you know, we, we want to provide something of value to you. Um, and, and we, you know, consider any type of participation that you want to have to be to be a real honor for us. So, you know, I think that's been a really good strategy. Um, Laura, your camera just popped on. I think you are still muted though. Okay, I was still muted. Good, that was a practice run. <laughs> um, I, I really wanna, Beret. I don't know if you recognize it from the pictures, but this is the one that I'm hoping to mail to you or send to you if you would like it. Um, uh, relentless, yes. Um, I just, <laughs> I think that's what we can keep doing. We, we just, um, the, the visual solidarity um, and 
one of the reasons why I, I felt that I could reach out to you, Justin, just like seeing your solidarity with like, vote. Um, and I think maybe like initially I was analyzing why all that time back you maybe followed me before I knew what your politics were. It was just kind of like, oh, there, here's this football player following me. And then I discovered how you were into progressive issues based politics and we've been following each other since. And um, you're just somebody who seems to believe in throwing like all good strategies and building everything in solidarity and and you know this means knitting for a good cause this means um visual imagery it means applying pressure and being willing to be um you know unpopular and and even ask ask for things ask to not just kind of go along and wait for them to tell us the strategy because um we, we need to be an all coach and uh, so the other day when I arrived home from work and saw, Justin, that you had on your new show of a takeover, and forgive me if all of this has been touched upon before we watched the film, I missed everything, but um, I just can't tell you how much that that m means to me and how much it means to whole Washington to see that in not only your introductory channel the takeover that you shouted out whole wash and new york health act and, and calcare in california um i was just astounded literally when you call me relentless that is one thing i have been on social media since ballot initiative 1600 i was like the next time that whole washington has a bill or you know an initiative process i want to make sure that we have enough of a social media following and just people like being part of that national conversation because we are like we we should all be standing together it's absolutely on the federal legislation as when it comes out we're going to be doing all of those actions we do that stuff all the time um so i don't want to too much go into uh but but the kind of solidarity that you have shown us by by putting us front and center in, in your early episodes and uh the solid Solidarity of Dr. Victoria Dooley and Senator Nina Turner putting on these red berets with whole wash. That's something truly that I will never be able to thank them. I will just continue to thank them every day because national movement leaders and organizations and elected officials, they get very focused on their strategy and don't necessarily want to get into the water with the grassroots. And I find that really, really limiting and unfortunate. So I, I just have to say that I, I just owe such a, we owe a huge debt of gratitude because they have really helped bring uh, whole Washington into this national strategy conversation. And that's what I got. I'm really, I hope we continue to build on that. That's what we need to do. Okay, so I'm gonna try to batch a couple together now and um, I'll just give my thoughts and then you guys can uh, vibe with whatever whatever jumps out at you. But um, so we have one that says, what does the state level movement in other states look like? Can you offer perspective about how momentum is building on the ground level? We have one that says, how do we convince our legislators and people that we don't have to settle for incrementalism? How can we demand change now? And then we have one that is, what can we do to more effectively, uh, sorry, not that one. Um, we can do healthcare differently than Canada. The Canada Health Act does not cover prescription drugs, home care, long-term care, or dental care. Provinces may provide partial coverage for their children, those living in poverty and seniors. Programs vary by province. So um, starting with the Canada one, uh, yes, I do think we can do differently. And by differently, I really hope that that can mean better. Um, and whole Washington's bill does cover vision, dental, reproductive care, mental health. Um, it, is, uh, it is an expansion of healthcare in many ways. Um, and, so, um, and so I think that that can be part of the answer to the other questions, which is that you can, you can often mobilize more people um, by offering more. Uh, there seems to be this attitude in politics that the way you make something more politically palatable is by um, 
by watering it down. And uh, people, people often don't want to show up um, for a bill that doesn't offer change to their life that feels meaningful. Um, and so then on the, on the question about incrementalism, um, you know, one of the things that always floors me about this movie is how fast the hospital system actually became desegregated. It was obviously a ton of activism that happens before you see the results of it, right? And so that part of the story is often uh, very, very hidden to a lot of people. But the, those charts that they show basically show that the hospital system was desegregated over about four or five months. Um, and so uh, there's a, an expression that, um, you know, I can't really attribute it, but it's that change happens uh, really slowly and then it happens all at once. Um, so, you know, let's not forget that this is something that has been worked on for decades. There are, you know, reams of studies and literature that show the superiority of this kind of healthcare system. Um, and, uh, and so uh, I think we need, to, we need to show that there is, um, well, we need to show that this is something that people want and, and they do, but, um, but we also need to give credit to all the work that's come in the past. Um, you know, when, when legislators finally show up and sign these things into law, um, I think there's often a lot of temptation uh, to give them the credit for it, but actually um, uh, it, it takes a lot less to show up after the work has been done to make something popular um, and to make something politically palatable. Um, that's the real work. Uh, signing it after it's popular is a lot easier. Um, so I think, I think we need to uh, maybe reframe with some of these uh, legislators that they can actually show up during, during the fight and not, not just at the end. Um, so, uh, so I don't know, that's just my thoughts on some of those, but. So um, I'm going to take a crack out some of these questions specifically related to whole Washington. Hey, everybody. I'm Sean Kavanaugh. I'm the volunteer campaign director of whole Washington. Um, it's awesome to be here. So I'm going to start with Olivia Hart's question. How can we support BIBOC people seeking alternative medicine for rare diseases? Asking for a friend. So um, the current system doesn't allow you to lobby your pharmaceutical or your insurance company to add a benefit. You're gonna to have to look from this company if they cover your spleen, but they don't cover your kidney. And then you gotta go, then you're like, oh, but you go over here and they cover the opposite. The great thing about whole Washington is that there is a way for citizens to lobby the government to add benefits. And so under section 105 of our bill advisory committees, there's three that are created and one of them is a citizens committee where their responsibility is to hold public hearings on the priorities of inclusion set in the health services, um, public satisfaction, investigate complaints people have and identify um, areas that need improvement on. And so, you know, if you have like a certain thing that you want on the benefits package, you and others can go and advocate for such a thing. It's my belief the more things that are covered in our bill, uh, the more efficient thing our entire health system is going to be because we're now paying less out-of-pocket costs. Um, and then what? We have another user asking, federal uh, Medicare only pays 80%. So would the state Medicare take care of the amount that we need now for insurance to cover? And so a lot of the costs, um, why insurance goes up and up is because those CEOs and those companies are just looking to create a profit. So just taking that out, we already gain savings without affecting hospitals and doctors. Now, when we counteract the market power that uh, the hospitals have, we're going to be negotiating with doctors to create a fair wage for everybody involved. Right now, a lot of doctors don't go into uh, family practitioners because it doesn't pay as well as a specialist, as a surgeon. And so we wanna remedy that so that we can really focus on preventive care 
um, to help drive down costs. Um, and we're not going to be paying 80% um, like the uh, Medicare does. We're gonna be paying more to doctors. Um, what else do we got here? Uh, I, I wanted to take one because we had a follow-up question about incrementalism. You know, the question is basically what's wrong with incrementalism? So I want to tie this into our legislative fight. Um, so, oh, uh, looks like Justin is about to drop. Um, so I'll just, uh, I still wanna answer this question, but Justin, thank you so much for being here. And if you wanna say anything on your way out, uh, please do. Yeah, sorry. I just, I have another meeting I have to hop into, but I, I really appreciate, like I said earlier, appreciate y'all having me on. I appreciate y'all fighting for this so hard, so aggressively, like you were saying, there are so many people who simply do not have the time. Um, they're working two, three jobs. They got fam, they got families to take care of. They got bills to pay. They can be, you know, brought over into this fight. They might not necessarily, you know, have the time and ability to be on the ground. So thank y'all so much for, you know, fighting for them. I'm in that with y'all. Um, y'all are invited on my show whenever you want to amplify the message. If there's any events you have coming up, fundraising drives, whatever, just hit me up. You know, you have, uh, Laura has my number. Hit me up whenever you need me. Thank you so much for, for letting me be a part of this. And I, I really sincerely hope that y'all can win this fight and we can win this fight uh, for, for Washington, for Cal Care in California, for the, in New York as well, and then nationally. So thank you so much, y'all. Thank, thank you, Justin. Justin. I'm sure we can. Okay. Um, so uh, to go back to the question, I, I wanted to bring that back into our experience working with uh, our state legislature. So our bill is on its second iteration, and uh, it's it's been made considerably more robust. It's been looked at by a lot of experts. It has a financing plan. It has a transition plan. And it, it could cover everyone in Washington state by 2023 if it was enacted in this session. Um, now, the legislature, which allegedly supports uh, creating a universal healthcare system in Washington state, has killed both of those bills in committee. And um, in its place, they advanced another bill, SB 5399, that they claimed was a, um, a more serious healthcare bill and it had more co-sponsors. Co now, that bill is four pages long. And um, one of the only things that it's clear about is that the first three years we spent basically exploring possibilities of ways we could achieve universal healthcare in Washington. Um, and this is on top of the fact that they commissioned another study in 2017 that already found that a system like what we are proposing is the most cost-effective solution. So um, I'm gonna speak a little bit more plainly than I, than I tend to on this kind of thing. One of the main problems with incrementalism is it's often a, uh, a fig leaf for not wanting to do what we're talking about. Um, and uh, I am not going to speak directly on what's in the hearts and the minds of the people um, in these committee chairs who have killed our bill. Um, I don't know, but you know, we just watched this documentary, right? And uh, you know, the, num the amount of legislation and reforms that had to be passed um, that should have desegregated the hospital system and didn't, uh, and it came down to enforcement, right? And that was that four month window. It was when it was going to be enforced. And then suddenly it happened very quickly. Um, the, I guess my takeaway from it is that, um, you know, if our legislature really wants to pass universal health care, they can pass our bill. They can do it through their bill. And if they pass it, if they do it through their bill, I will like applaud them for it. Um, but the real question is, are you going to do it? And, uh, you know, I think if you, if you look at the longer history of this, we're not talking about incrementalism. We're talking about people who want this and people who don't. Um, and so that is why uh, I don't think we should demonize incrementalism, but why we view it with a lot of skepticism. Yeah, and um, 
how long are you going to ask people to wait for their rights? You know, black people have been waiting 400 years to be considered a person in this country. Um, so that's what's wrong with incrementalism is that people die while waiting for this stuff to happen. Um, let's see some other questions. Mm. So how does the progressive taxation scheme that we've proposed in our bill incorporate the savings that we'll experience? So whole Washington's bill is gonna save our state at least uh, around $9 billion. And so uh, to put that in perspective, um, you know, in 1998, we were paying um, about 10% of our GDP and, and towards healthcare. Now, 2017, it was about 14%, and in 2030, it's going to be 17. And so, what does that mean? That means that there's less resources that our state has available to fund our schools, to fix our roads and our bridges. The West Seattle Bridge is broken, um, and any and providing services to um, communities in need, like the homeless or the poor. And so, with those savings, we're going to be able to invest in for instance, building hospitals in rural communities um, or areas that are underserved um, and all those other things that we could be spending our money on, plus having more money in our uh, paychecks. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, what other questions do we have? Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Michael, you had a question on how does our Washington bill SB 5204 affect undocumented immigrants, um, our fellow neighbors. So we don't leave anybody behind um, in our bill. Uh, we protect everybody. So in our bill, it says we will cover all residents. And so that means citizens and non-citizens. Um, when we have, when we cover everybody in our community, we're all protected. So no longer will our undocumented brothers and sisters have to just um, wait and like not avoid care. We'll be able to see a doctor um, and like everybody else not go bankrupt uh, from the costs. Yeah, and I wanna add a bit to that, which is, um, you know, this is a matter of, you know, this is a moral issue. This is a matter of justice. This is what it means to actually believe that healthcare is a right. But on top of that, you know, we are living through a pandemic. It's not over yet. And I think that if that underscores anything, it is that healthcare is not individual. Um, we are social, you know, we, we live in a society to quote um, a famous philosopher. And, um, and uh, pandemics don't really care about your status as a citizen. They don't understand what a state line is. Um, and so that is why I think we need to shift our thinking, not just about our individual healthcare needs, but thinking in terms of a public health system. Um, because the fact is we, we can only be uh, healthy relative to the environment that we live in. And public health is about creating an environment that we can live and thrive in. For sure. All right. Um, is, this, is this event going a bit over? It, it, it is a little bit over. And I know that we have more questions. Um, so we should probably wrap it up at this point. But um, we should also give some ways for people to stay in touch with what we're doing, get those questions answered. Um, you know, we want to be in touch with everybody. So, um, you know, one more time, it's wholewashington.org. Um, and there's contact information. There's volunteer signups. Um, you can also find us on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter, Captain Stack. I answer as many questions as I can. I don't care if you're a rando. I will, um, I will work with you to um, make you feel like you understand, um, even if you don't necessarily support. Uh, and um, yeah, anything else that we should shout out? There's one pair of states. If you want to find um, statewide efforts where you live, um, anything else, Sean? I think that's it. Just go to wholewashington.org uh, and volunteer. We're the leading organization fighting for real universal health care in the state. 
donate. We need resources. We're not going to out raise. We're going to out organize to win universal health care. Um, when we're all participating and doing what we can, that's when we win. And that's when we're dangerous to the corporations. So, And also, uh, we aren't going to outraise, but we did raise $2,000 for this event just right. uh, over the course of this event. So thank you so much. You donated. Everyone thank who you, donated, yeah. um, that donation yeah, page will continue great. to be open. We will continue to need them. Um, but uh, but thank you so much for everyone who shared this uh, afternoon with us. And I hope you all learned something. Oh, and one more thing. We are still fighting our- in Wait, the wait, wait, one second, one. Laura, excuse me. Um, we're also fighting in the legislature. Uh, we're doing our lobby days and we're doing 10 days of action <laughs> where we're, where we're um, commenting on the bill, contacting our representatives to force them to hold a hearing in the Senate. It's not too late. Don't let anybody tell you that it is. There's rules that they can hold any hearing that they want to with a simple majority vote. So help participate in that and let's win this. Laura? You there, Laura? Yes, thank you. And my, my last pitch is just, oh, well, my internet is very unstable. Can you hear me at all? Yes. Okay. Oh, you can hear me? Mm hmm Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, um, I had the math all worked out for those of you who are still considering going to the donation link. And um, I really like what Sean said that we, we're going to out organize. Um, we try to make you know the the red berets in bundles of five and ten those are marked down from just the price of one um georgia davenport has a lot of these in her office i'd love her to basically you're you're sponsoring petitions when you order these it's like thinking of the hours that go into crafting them um and just the petitions are like a dollar a piece i'm sure you guys covered that It'd be really neat if you are still considering donating, if you can help Georgia's office empty out so that Michelle DVA and Fran Bauer can continue to send more so she can be stocked up again. Thank you. All right. Um, so we're not gonna keep you any longer. You've got a weekend to enjoy. So thank you everyone. It's been wonderful. Um, we're gonna keep doing events like this. And uh, you know, we have weekly meetings, Monday meetings. Um, so that's, uh, that's the first stop if you wanna just get in there and uh, start doing the work with us. And uh, so yeah, take care and uh, you know, keep fighting for what's right. Bye everybody. <laughs>